time of Adam and Eve up to this very day, there's been billions of people, billions of people, billions and billions of people have been born. But when you come right down to it, how many have understood the importance of the resurrections? Most people don't know anything about the resurrections. Because what the resurrections do, they tell us what the plan of salvation is all about. And so today, modern Christianity doesn't have too much to do with the resurrection. Because if you believe in Jesus Christ, you die, you go to heaven. And if you don't, you die, you go to hell. That's the way it is. And I'm sure if you look at the other religions, they're probably similar to that, that they go someplace when they die. But to understand God's plan, you have to understand the resurrections. If you don't understand that, you don't understand anything about the plan of God. So the title of this sermon is Born to be Born Again. That's what we're here for. We're born to be born again. Something that is absolutely void of the modern Christian mind or any, any converted mind. It doesn't make any difference. For those who will be hearing this later, this is not a DVD. Where is it? You put it on DVD? Okay. And CD. You're new to the church, you're new to what we have to say. This is going to be very interesting for you. Because you have to know about the resurrection. Do you want to know which one you want to be a part of? That's a good question. Which resurrections do you want to be a part of? Church members, I don't know if I ever thought this way, but I've tried to think back in time since I've been in the church. Did I ever wish that one time which God did not wish he did not have called at this particular point in time that had been much better for me personally if he had called me in the second resurrection. That way I don't have Satan overcome. I don't have anything to do to have a nice world to live in. Everything be perfect. And that way I could come to the knowledge as the rest of the people would come to the knowledge. I don't know if I ever thought that, and I'm pretty sure there have probably been members who thought that way, that they'd rather come up in another resurrection than this first resurrection. And that is a very bad way to think once we go through this. Because you and I were born to be born again. So you maybe think you'd wish God just waited a little bit longer and called you at a later time. It would have been much easier to qualify for the kingdom of God. Most people don't understand that. We have to qualify for the kingdom of God. It's not an automatic thing. Except when Jesus Christ and person say it's not get you in the kingdom of God at all. But you're going to have to qualify for this position. Or to be born in that way. Born in the kingdom of God. Sometimes maybe they think, well, I know it's rough. Being a part of the church of God is rough. And it's going to get much rougher as we get, to get closer to the end time. So you're going to go through rough times. All of us have done that. Then you get to the point you have a little bit of unbelief. You get frustrated. You have doubts. Because things just don't go right with you. They just don't. I don't care who you are. They just don't. So then you have to put up the scorn. You have to put up the ridicule. You have to put up family members who don't believe the way you believe. They give you such a hard time. And you get frustrated. And sometimes you just, you're on that road to eternal life and you just give up and you quit. You just quit. I can't take it anymore. So maybe you're married to an unconverted man. It gives you such a hard time. I've known people like that. And you just had enough. It's enough. It's, the first resurrection is not worth it. Is what people say if they do that. And a lot of people have done that. Give up and quit. So, if you're a person who wished this, you simply don't understand the resurrections. You don't. You simply don't. You don't know what it means to be called in this age. A lot of people don't. Or just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Things are going to happen. And these are, there are, there are frightful times to live in, but there are also exciting times to live in what is about to take place on this earth. For decades and decades, the Church of God has preached the coming kingdom of God to this earth. And we've waited, and I've been waiting for over 30 some years for it, and it's still out of here. But what is 30 some years in the time span of God? Is that what a blink of an eye? 
We know a thousand years is just like a, a day to him. So what is 30 some years to God? It's a long time to me, but it isn't to God. It's just like a blink of an eye or just a few seconds. So we just don't understand if we don't want to be a part of the better resurrection, the first resurrection. We don't, we don't know and understand the fantastic goals and purpose set before us if we wish we'd been called later. Instead of now. The Apostle Peter puts it this way. 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, and verse 9. We forget that God is in control. We kind of let it slip to the back recesses of our mind and forget this thing. But this is what Peter says about the 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, verse 9. <clears throat> so the Lord is not so much concerned in His promise. What well, is the promise? Eternal life. And more, more than that. As some men count slackness, but it is long suffering to us, but not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So God wants all of us in His kingdom, but not all of us in our bank. It's just not going to happen. So God wants us to come to repentance. And Paul writes in 2, 1 Timothy, the second chapter in verse 4, he says that God will have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. So to understand the knowledge of truth means we want to be part of the first resurrection. Because there's a lot more involved in the first resurrection than the second resurrection, which a lot of people have no idea of what it's about. Don't even know that there's more than one resurrection. As I said, modern Christianity doesn't pay any attention to resurrections because they're already in heaven if they die. They've gone off to be with the Lord. So there's no purpose for having a resurrection at all. But as I said, these resurrections, they depict God's plan of salvation for mankind, how he's going to bring it all about. It is God that calls us to the knowledge of truth and grants us repentance. You read that in John 6, 44 and verse 65. He says, no man can come to me unless the Father draws him. And it says in Romans, Paul wrote to the Roman church that it is God's goodness that grants us repentance. So you can't even repent the way you want to unless God grants it for you or to you. So we've got to truly understand that God is in absolute control of this universe and what's going on in this world. And he is working out a plan down here. That's why all this so much confusion. They simply don't understand the resurrection of the plan of salvation. They don't. You've got all this religious confusion. Oh, no wonder people get all upset when they bring the Bible into it. I don't want to hear that, you know, because there's so many conflicting ideas out there. Well, the truth is, but they never understand that one verse right there. No man can come to me unless God calls that person. And then it says that God is the one who opens a person's mind. It's not me. I can't open anybody's mind. I can't even open my own mind. And so God is in absolute control. He knows what he's doing. He's working out this plan down there. The plan involves spirit-born sons and daughters to be part of his divine family. And you just don't hear that stuff in, in religious services at all. All human beings who have ever been born or ever will be born will have their chance to come to the knowledge of truth. That's not what modern Christianity says. If you don't accept him now, well, see, you're going off to hell. You're going to burn up in hell. But God doesn't say that. That's not his plan at all. They will someday come to understand this, that they have been born to be born again. Born to be born again. Into the grace kingdom of God as spirit beings you would think they'd come to understand it because this body only lasts a few years. And it's dead. Well, what happens to it? What happens to the body when you die? So the real purpose on this, this life, on this planet, is to qualify for God's kingdom that you can be born again. You know, they use that old saying today, they've already been born again, which is ridiculous. They don't know what you're talking about. And I'll never forget years ago, I think I've mentioned this before, but Billy Graham was on television giving a sermon about what it meant to be born again. And he went through John, the third chapter there. But when it came right down to the very point when Jesus Christ explained what it meant to be born again, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit, he just went right over it. Went right over it. I waited over an hour waiting for him to tell me what it meant to be born again. 
I said, what do you mean? I just clicked him off. He doesn't know what he's talking about. The millions of people that man has spoken to, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. So they're going to have to relearn. And we're told in Matthew 6, chapter verse 33, we're to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness are his laws, to do his laws. So the vast majority of people that have lived and died without ever hearing the real purpose of them while they were born. That's a true, that's an absolute fact. You know, I don't know what modern Christianity thinks about the people in the Old Testament, how they get into heaven since Jesus Christ wasn't born yet. And he said, that's the only name on the son, it's a person to be saved. So what are they going to do? How do they get them into heaven? I don't have a clue. In fact, they, they, I don't think they say very much about it at all. They ignore the fact that Jesus Christ says no one has to send up to heaven. So that means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which are the fathers, are not in heaven. And Jesus Christ, I don't know what he's talking about. So he's the one who came down from here. I know who's up there. So how do they get them into heaven? I don't have a clue. Because they, play, they pay no attention to the plan of salvation. They've done away with God's holy days because they misunderstand Colossians, the second chapter. And they don't want you talking about. And they're confused with a lot of people on this earth who want to know. They're, these people going to church on Sunday, they're not bad people. My father's a Baptist man. He was a good man. And my, what's left of my family are really good people. But they are deceived. I was deceived. And there's the hardworking, deceived, honest people who want to do what is right. But it's simply because their people who sit in front of them teaching them don't have a clue at what it's going to take to be a part of the kingdom of God. And so they're going to be in it for a great surprise. In a very, I'm not talking about years down the road. I'm talking about months. Months. Because we'll get into it next week if John allows me to do the services. Or if we meet here. I'll get it all together and I'm going to show you what is about to happen to this country. It's a frightening thing. And so these people are going to be delusional. They're going to, I don't know what they're going to think. When all this comes down, you think they're going to be raptured off? Well, I'm sorry, they're not. They're simply not going to be raptured off. So the vast majority does not know the purpose that God is working on this earth. They don't know why they're even born. It'll be during the second. The people who are not called for the first resurrection, who are going to come up in the second resurrection, for you people who never heard this, they're going to come up in the second resurrection. They're going to have their chance, their first chance. This is not a second chance. This is the first chance that God is going to call these people. And he is going to open their mind just as he has opened our minds to the church and the, the members of the church of God. These people who come up in the second resurrection have never heard of Jesus Christ. Think about the millions of people who were born from the time of Adam down to the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not even born. They've never heard of that name, Jesus Christ. Now they're going to come to know about who he was. Now they're going to come in the second resurrection to know the truth. Even a lot of the prophets do not really understand a lot of things. Dan said, I I heard it, but I don't understand it. And so he's going to come up, not in the second resurrection, but he'll come up. And he's going to understand things he didn't understand before. And we're all, it's all like all of us, when we come up in a resurrection, the first resurrection, we're going to understand things that we've never heard before. We don't have to. It's got a lot of work for us ahead of us. So those people who come up in the second resurrection, they're going to learn the truth then they're going to have a chance to qualify, just as you and I have right now are having a chance to qualify for eternal life. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And I hear so many of these ministers who get up and preach against this. I so still this, this is a terrible thing. He said, I've heard that you do not want to be a part of this judgment. It's a judgment, just like you and I are being judged. It's a judgment. It's not a sentencing. It's a judgment. And they're going to be judged, just like the church of God is being judged today. The thing is, if you want to look up at the Bible, you will never find the term the second resurrection. It's not in there. Well, then David had you know even there is a second resurrection. Because it teaches that. It teaches that. It says, but it does teach the resurrection of all the dead who have never known the truth. That's what it says in, in the book of Revelation. As we shall see. The reason it's called the second resurrection simply because it comes after the first. Revelation 20, chapter verse 6. You all know this by heart, but people have never heard this before. It says, Blessed, 
Revelation 20, verse 6, is blessed and holy is he that takes part in the first resurrection. If there was no second resurrection, the word first wouldn't be here. It would just be take part in the resurrection. But that's not what it says. It says he takes part in the first resurrection. So just when does the second resurrection take place? Who will be in it? And what will it be like? Good question. Maybe some of the church members have wondered about that. How long will the second resurrection? How long will they live during the second resurrection? So John was given the future given a vision of the future of God by God, and he saw things that must shortly come to pass. He says in Revelation 1, verse 1. He let John see things that were shortly, shortly going to come to pass. Now, the 20th chapter, verse 5, tells us exactly when the second resurrection is going to come about. Revelation 20, verse 4, which says this, It says, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until after, until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. It says, it goes on, it says Blessed and holy is he that takes part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. So right there it tells us what it is. So the second resurrection takes place shortly after the millennium, millennium or the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Very shortly right after that. And who's going, to, who's going to be there will be the saints who's going to rule with Jesus Christ. I had a little one thing I had a little problem with. He says, when Satan is let loose, I always thought that it was during the second resurrection, but it's not. It can't be. Because when these people come up in the second resurrection, it says he's going out to see the nations of God and Magog. But the people who want to come up in the second resurrection will come up with the same man they died with, which is a carnal man, which is a sinning man, which is against God. So he can't deceive them. He's already been deceived once. So sometime just before the end of the first resurrection, before the second resurrection takes place, he is going out to those people who have already known and seen God face to face, have seen you probably face to face, who have come up in the first resurrection. That's who he's going to deceive. And it just tells me how good he is. How good he is. He can come right back and deceive people who have, I've never seen Jesus Christ. I've never seen the Father. I've never seen any angels. But here these people have. Because it's at the end of the thousand years. The million of reign of Jesus Christ when Satan goes out and deceives these people. It has to be. It has to be. Because before he's before this second resurrection takes place, if you keep on reading, after he has done this, deceived those people, he's thrown into the lake of fire and his demons. Then the second resurrection comes. So he goes out and deceives people who already have seen God face to who has been to Jerusalem, who have kept the feast of Tabernacles, who have kept the holy days, who knows all these things has seen the great beauty of the temple in Jerusalem there. And have probably seen people converted right before their very eyes and changed into a spirit being. And yet Satan still is clever enough how he did, or he's going to deceive those people who have known the truth. And they're burned up. If you read, they're burned up. John goes on in verse 11 and 12, and he says, I saw a great pot thrown and him that sat on, from whose, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And this is, I saw the dead, small and great. Now listen, I've read this, but I read right over this. He says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, that is the Old and New Testament, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. They were never judged before. They had no knowledge of the truth at all. That's what it says here. They were judged out of the books, things written in the Bible. Just like you and I are being judged according to James. The law of liberty. These people didn't even know the truth. They had no clue about the knowledge of God, the truth, the resurrection, the plan of salvation at all. And now they're going to be judged. They're going to stand before the great white throne judgment and judge. So this is the second resurrection. 
where the dead, small and great, who have never were never judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Now they're going to be. It's entirely different than these people being in hell. Isn't it? Down there dying. I'll never forget what old uh, what's his name down in Louisiana said about <coughs> this judge appeared here. When is that guy's name down there? He got caught with the prostitute in the motel <coughs> in Louisiana. Well, I can't think of his name. He's back on television. Many he got up there and he told about this judge who appeared. He said, What's going to happen here in the great body of judgment? These people are going to be brought out of hell. They're going to be judged, and God is going to start stirring the fire apart and put them back in. Now, how ignorant of the Bible can you say you sense? They were never judged in the first place. For God to do what he says he's going to be, it'd be a cruel God. But that's not what's going to happen at all. You're going to be judged according to the work as flesh and blood human beings. So, just when does God begin to judge people from the Bible? When does he do that? You know all this by heart. 1 Peter 4, chapter, verse 17. 1 Peter 4, chapter, verse 17 says, The time is now come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And, and if at first begins at us, what shall be the end of those who obey not the gospel of God? For those who are not a part of the church of God, the house of God is the church of God. Let me say that again. If you're not a part of the church of God, what Peter says here, the house of God is talking about the church of God. And you can read about that in 1 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 15, which is called the house of God, which is called the church of God. We in God's church are now being judged according to our works, according to our obedience to his laws and his precepts. Now, right now, as we live, from the very time we were baptized. Our, church, our judgment first began when God called us. We were baptized and had hands laid on us and received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we come into the knowledge of truth. We are now, as members of God's church, being judged now until the day we die or are changed at the time of Jesus Christ's return. It's called the days of unleavened bread. If you've never heard of those things, the, the people who are not members of the church of God. We're being judged, and we're being judged from the first day of our baptism until the day we die. And we're, those members of God's church are striving that Jesus Christ said, Become ye therefore perfect. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to have a perfect mind, a perfect attitude, so we can be born again into the very family of God. And this is the first, what we're going to go through now. We have to overcome three things. As members of God's church, we have to overcome the, the peer pressures of this world, this society. We have to overcome our own human nature, which is under the sway of the Satan of this world, God of this world, which is the Satan devil. So those three things that those, the members of God's church now have to overcome and be judged by how we're doing. But when it comes up in the second resurrection, the Satan devil is not there. But you still have human nature. You still have to overcome your own human nature. And you still have to qualify for the kingdom of God in the second resurrection. And so that's this judgment here for the church is called the days of unleavened bread. Great men in the eyes of the world. Now think about this. For those who come up in the first resurrection, this is the better resurrection. For those people who come up in this first resurrection, it says the great and small and great were raised up. And then billions of other people will be raised up. But you're going to deal with these people. You're going to be dealing with people who are great in the eyes of the world, kings and prime ministers. People of this nature are going to Come before the family of God, who are part of the first resurrection. They're going to come before the great white throne, and millions and billions of other people are going to come before you. This is called the better resurrection. These are the second resurrection. So, great men, small men, right? you got people like. Uh, just think about all the great men in the past world. The people think is what they call Alexander the Great. I got in an argument with an atheist one time. There's nothing great about him. What's great about him? All he did was run around killing people. And they want to call him the Alexander the Great. So he'll be up in the resurrection and he'll come face to face with you, probably. So, just what will this resurrection be like? How long will they live and what kind of world will they live in? The second resurrection. At the time of the second resurrection, people will be rising out of their graves, not coming down out of heaven. Sorry, folks. 
If you believe you're going to heaven, they're going to come out of their graves. They're going to come out of the seas. They're going to come back from where they died to a physical life on this earth. It doesn't matter how or when or where they died. God has the power to give them another physical body and exactly what he's going to do. He's going to breathe life into them and place, and place them in a dry and a safe place. This second resurrection is going to be a great shock to these people. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine when they come up in the resurrection? And they're going to look around. Is this heaven? I thought I went to heaven. And they're going to find they didn't go to heaven. They're going to look around and go, well, I knew you. You never accept Jesus Christ. You mean you didn't go to hell? No. I don't know where I've been. I didn't even know I was dead. It's going to be funny. It's going to be shocking to these people to feel out, realize that when Jerry Falwell comes up out of this grave, he didn't go to heaven. As much as he preached about going to heaven, he's going to find out and look around. Well, what are they going to find their own earth? They're going to be right here on this earth. It's going to come out to be a great shock to a lot of these people who preach just the exact opposite. And the thing is, Ezekiel tells us about this resurrection, the second resurrection. He heard it. He heard it. And he saw it as the plan was going to happen. Ezekiel 37 chapter. Ezekiel 37 chapter. We begin to verse 7. And he said, There was a noise, so he heard a noise. And behold, or suddenly there was a rattle. And the bones came together, bone to bone. Lo, the sinew and the flesh came up on them, and skin covered them, covered them above or over them. And there was no breath in them. You know, they were breathing it. Verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath, or the breath of life, came into them. And they lived, and they stood on their feet, and were exceeding great art. That's a physical resurrection. You can't get around it. Flesh and blood, sin, human skin, is bone is physical. A physical resurrection. This is the time of the second resurrection, a resurrection to physical life. So we can begin to see how God is working out His plan of salvation on this earth. And so this is going to be a great, it's going to be a fantastic event. Now, knowing that, wouldn't you like to be there? Be a part of the first resurrection and have a hand in helping these people? Because you know why? Because some of these people are going to be your kinfolk. Some of these people are going to be your friends. Something is going to be your neighbors, going to be your relatives. They're going to be coming back out of their graves. And you have an opportunity to be a part of the first resurrection as God planned salvation works out for the church to be there, to teach, to instruct these people who were once hard-headed, heads like plant, heart that is of a stone, and you're going to have a chance to change that. That's what the saints are going to do in the first resurrection, have part in the first resurrection. That's why we were born to be born again. To have the ability to teach and to instruct people in the future. The right way to live. They won't listen to you now. But they're going to listen to you in the very near future. They will listen to you. So how long do these people live? I thought about this. Certain members of my family. Isaiah 65 and verse 19 through 21. Isaiah 65 verse 19 and 21. He says, And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old. But the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be a curse. I've wondered about that. What was that? During the second resurrection. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and shall eat the fruit of them. Physical. A physical resurrection. Verse 23, verse 20 to 25. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth trouble. For trouble for they are the seed of the blessing of the Lord and their offsprings with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer them. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. For the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullet, and the dust of the serpent shall be meat or food. They shall not hurt and destroy my holy mountain, says the Lord God. So these people will be resurrected to what? They will be resurrected to a wonderful, peaceful place on this earth. No more wars, 
No more violence, no more crimes, no more gangs, no more motorcycle gangs or other type of gangs that exist today. No more lusting for things of this nature. It's going to be a wonderful world. These people are going to be resurrected into. And they're going to have a wonderful life. They're going to be no more broken families. Everyone will work and have an enjoyable life at this particular point in time. These people will have peace. They will have happiness. They will be safety everywhere. So verse 20, we go back to verse 20, indicates this. That everyone who is resurrected, who died young, who died old, will be given 100 years. So, I was wondering about my sister when she died at 80. You know, will she live to be 108? Or will she live, I think so, I think that's what it's indicated, that she will live another 100 years. And if you die, you die when you're an infant, you'll live to be 100 years old. There'll be no more children born from this in the second resurrection, none whatsoever. It will all come to a stop. So they'll live to be 100 years old. He said, no new babies will be born during this period. And after the 100 years is up, those who are qualified to be born, to, born, to be born again, be given a new birth in the kingdom of God. They'll have 100 years to deal with their human nature. 100 years to deal with you. 100 years to overcome. 100 years to develop the mind and the very character of God, to qualify for the kingdom of God. I say the vast majority of them will make that. But it says the sinners will be accursed. It means they're going to die. Not a physical death this time. Not a death this time. That's, well, it's going to be physical, but they're going to be cremated alive. These people who will not repent. And there's probably been people like that. And they just like the people in the kingdom of God there. And Satan got to them. There's probably going to be people who said, I don't want it. It's going to be an amazing thing, but hopefully it's just a very small few, if not, hopefully not any. But it says if you're a sinner and you're being accursed, if you refuse to repent and refuse to obey God's laws and things of this nature, then I'll just you know, do away with you. you just kill them. Let them die again. And they'll come up in the third resurrection. If some don't qualify, they will be accursed or they will be destroyed in the lake of fire and remain dead forever. This will happen in the third resurrection. But just like the second resurrection, the third resurrection, there's not mentioned in the Bible. It doesn't say the third resurrection. You can't find it. It's not there. But there is one more final resurrection. The number three resurrection is God's number for finality. Three means finality. Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. Matthew 28, verse 5 through 7. And Romans 1 through 4. He was resurrected as a spirit being. But if you notice, when the, when the veil was torn in the temple, that there were some saints that were resurrected back to physical life. Not a spirit life, but a physical life. And they were resurrected at the same time. All these were resurrected at the same time. They were done that for very special witnesses. But it had to be somebody who knew them. Because they went back and, and people who saw them couldn't believe them. So they had to be, it could, it's like my father, if he was resurrected today, no one would know who he was. He died in 65. No one would know. People live in the day. So those people who died and were resurrected had to be known. At that period. There were saints in him, so they had to be known. And other people were also resurrected. Revelation 20 and John 5 and verse 25. The 29 shows that there are three general resurrections through which God will accomplish and complete His plan of salvation for humans on this earth. But you can listen to the religious programs that all during the week and you'll hear nothing, nothing about these resurrections. The first resurrection is for those who have lived and known and obeyed God before the second coming of Jesus Christ. They are called saints in the Bible. So, when people qualify during the, now there's, there's another thing here. And you know, all these people that are going to be alive during the millennium reign of Jesus Christ, what about those people? They have to qualify, just like you and I. They have to qualify during the millennium and will eventually change immediately into spirit beings. They don't have to wait. They don't, like so. they don't have to die and wait because they'll be changed immediately. Once they have qualified and, and tested, showed God 
they, they want this. They want to be a part of this. There is no resurrection from the day mentioned in the Bible of those who call for God's spirit during the kingdom or during the reign, millennial reign of Jesus Christ. That's true. There's nothing in there. So they have to change. They can't live a thousand years. As human beings, that would be ridiculous. So they're going to have to, once they have qualified for that, then they will be changed immediately into a spirit being. The second resurrection is for those who have lived and died prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ, but they were not, they were never knowing the truth. That's what it says. They're going to be judged. They've never been judged because they didn't know. They had no idea. This includes the vast majority of all human beings who have ever lived, and that includes billions and billions of people on this earth who have never known the name of Jesus Christ. They will be brought up in the second resurrection, not given a second chance, as I've said. They're given their first chance, their first opportunity to come to the knowledge of truth. And they're going to get that truth from you and I and now the pages of the Bible as we teach them. The third resurrection is for all who have known God's way but would not repent, would not obey God. These people were once baptized, and we probably know a bunch of those. They were once baptized and started on the road to eternal life. And for whatever reason, whatever reason, they gave it up in court. And we probably know lots of people. And I think my brother was one of them. He spent more years in the church of God than I did. And I understand he started keeping Christmas and all this other nonsense. So it looks like he may come up to the third resurrection after all that time knowing the truth. I don't know. But it's God. But whatever reason, whatever reason, we know by the hundreds, by the thousands, they've given up and quit. Just for the church of God, we lost a part of it. They turned around and, and forgot God's way. And they began to sin willfully. After that, they come, after they've come to the knowledge of the truth, they did it willfully. You read about that in Hebrews 10, verse 26 through 27. It will include those who will not repent or obey during the millennium. Also, can you imagine people in the millennium saying they don't want what they see? Of course, the lake of fire is going to be there all during that thousand year reign. You can read about it. The false prophet and the beast are thrown into it, and you can see a thousand year later, Satan and the devil is thrown right into the same lake. And so it's going to be there for a thousand years for people to look at and say, This is your destiny. If you don't want to obey God, you're going over there. And we're not going to waste time with you. Because you're going to see God face to face. You're going to see the saints face to face. You're not going to see the glorified body because they'd kill them instantly if you were showing your glorified body. But you can disappear before them. You can do things that your, your minds can't imagine to do to show them that you are a part of the family of God. And it probably they will even see Abraham and Isaac. They're going to see Jesus Christ face to face. And you're going to see all the saints. They've read about the Old and New Testament face to face. And for they don't want to obey the God of the universe, right here, they're going into a lake of fire. Get rid of it. To be cremated. There's probably a very small few, if any at all. So members of God's church, do we really realize that if we don't qualify for this new birth, as if we're born to be born again, that Christ isn't coming, then what resurrection are you coming? That is something we all need to think about. If I die today, which resurrection will I come up in? The first, not coming up in the second, or the third. And we all know what the first is, and we all know and understand what the second is. So it's a very heavy thing to have on your mind to think about. So, there is no second chance for you and I. We either make it or we don't. There's too much to lose, even consider slipping away, isn't there? Far too much to lose to consider slipping away. The lake of fire is there for the fearful and the unbelieving. The fearful and the unbelieving. Have you ever heard anybody in church say, I'm so afraid? I've heard that. I'm afraid. I'm fearful. Well, God says, I can't use you. If you're fearful, you don't change, you're going to be by now. I never said that to you in Revelation 21, verse 8. The fearful. And then believe me, you will be thrown into the lake of fire. So, if you're fearful, we need to be getting, getting rid of that being fearful and, and believe the wonderful promises that God has made to us. 
And there are a lot of them, I didn't have time to go through all the promises, but we'll look at one or two of them here. This is what God has done for us. 2 Timothy, 1 chapter, verse 7. This is what God has done for us. It's just one thing. He has given us the spirit of power to overcome and to qualify for the first resurrection. To qualify to be born again. For the empowerment and impregnation of the Holy Spirit in our minds, His power is there for us to overcome. That's why it's called the better resurrection, the first resurrection. Now notice what Hebrews 11, 40 says. Notice, I've read this and just, sometimes this goes over my mind. Hebrews 11, verse 40. This is the faith chapter. He says, God having provided something better, the last part of it, verse 40. He says, God having provided something better for us that they, without us, should not be made perfect. Now, what did you just read there? These people you read about in the 11th chapter of Daniel, uh, Hebrews there, are dead. They're dead. But what did it say there? They, without us. They're waiting on us. These dead people who are coming in the first resurrection, who this great cloud of witnesses, as Paul says, are waiting on us to qualify for eternal life. So the question is, are we as members of God's church qualifying for eternal life? Because there's a lot of people waiting on us to do, the, to do that. These people have already qualified and just waiting in their graves to come out in the first resurrection. He says they're waiting on us. They're waiting on us. And this is the thing about this. The first resurrection is the only resurrection to eternal life. The first resurrection is the only to eternal life. You can read about that. We've read this in 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 16 through 17, and 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 51 and 53. The first resurrection is the only resurrection to eternal life. So if we have built godly character in this present life, we will be given a glorified body, powerful spirit bodies, which will not die, which cannot be destroyed. This will happen at the first resurrection. Sounds great to me. Sounds something I want to be a part of. To have a glorified body and never die. You know? To do things I've never been able to do before. Those who come up in the second resurrection will have to build the same godly character that you and I have to do now. It'll be a lot easier for those because Satan will be around. And it'll be a perfect world they want to live in. But still, they have to deal with for 100 years. They're going to have to deal with their human nature. That's a lot of pressure to put on a person, isn't it, for 100 years to deal with it. And you're going to have, they're going to have to deal with it. Just like you and I have to deal with it now. Those in the first resurrection will live and reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years as kings and priests on this earth. Those who come up in the second resurrection will not. Those who come up in the first resurrection are the bride of Christ. Those who come up in the, will be changed in, in the second resurrection will not be a part of the bride of Christ. He's only got one bride. And that's the body of Christ. And so that's another reason to be a part of the first resurrection. You're a part of the body of Christ. Not only that, we're going to look at a few other things in closing here in just a second. So we're going to be kings and priests on this earth. So we need to think about what we have just said. Are you ready out there? And to be king and a priest on this earth and to reign with Jesus Christ. That's a lot to entail for a human being. Because I don't know what it's like to be a king. I don't know what it's like to be a priest with a glorified spirit body, to be able to do things and walk through walls and, and travel at the speed of thought and to think things I've never been able to think before, to do things I've never been able to, be able to do before as a physical human being. So these are great promises God has promised to give us as a member of the first resurrection, as a member of the family of God. None of that is going to do more. It's more and more. There's lots of, I believe, a lot of that. So we're going to be ruling over people in this new world to come. We'll be helping and guiding and correcting and blessing and teaching people. I like to teach people. That's the truth. I think it's, it's fascinating to be able to do that. Sit down with this, especially somebody who wants to learn. 
and be able to teach them. You don't have to sit there and argue with them back and forth. And they'll be teachable. And so their minds will be teachable during the second resurrection to have a part of that, to be a teacher. As, as Isaiah says in 30, chapter 30, verse 20 and 21, to be a teacher in the kingdom of God. And people's going to listen to you. They're going to see you face to face. And there's going to be times when you're going to say, this is the way you walk in. And they want to just hear the voice. And it's, that could be you. It could be us. So, I want to be a part of this, and I'm sure we do, and I hope those members, the people out there who are hearing this, who are not a part of the church of God, will come to repentance if God is calling you. Because time is running out. You don't have much time left, <coughs> excuse me, to make a choice here. There's going to be a point, and there's going to be a point of no return, and it's going to be too late. And it's getting faster and faster upon us. It's very close, probably as we say, as Christ, even at the door. That's how close the great tribulation is coming upon the United States of America. So I don't want to miss out on this. And I don't think church members want to miss out on this great opportunity to live and to work with Jesus Christ for a thousand years and all the people who have read about in the Old and New Testament. People like Samson, Abraham and Isaac. Talk to David. Say, what well, he had to really talk to the life. What really happened on that particular day? What went through his mind when he looked up to that guy? It's going to be an interesting conversation to take place, don't you think? So Christ is coming soon to rule this earth, to bring God's government, to establish peace, to establish happiness and prosperity with something this world knows nothing about. And we're going to have a direct part in this if we want it. God has called you and me to be a part of the first resurrection. He's called us to be born again. We've been born once, and He wants to cause us to be born again. He's the very family of God. And that entails a lot. He expects a lot out of us. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to make, help us to accomplish that goal that which is set before us. So are we beginning to see that life in God's kingdom as a spirit being is the greatest thing that can ever happen to any one person? To be born in the very family of God is the greatest thing that you and I can accomplish in this life. And God's help, he's going to help us get through this. He's going to help us to make it into the God's kingdom if we allow that to happen, if we're allowed to do that. So in order to be born again, we have to be a part of the first resurrection. That's it for us. We have to make it. There is no place second chance for us. So we, got, we have no choice but to make it. Live according to God's line, laws to attain the family of God, to be a part of the family of God. So we and us must be a part of the first resurrection, the real resurrection. So here's some of the things in closing that God has promised us. It's in the book of Revelation, in chapters 2 and verses 3. So we're looking at Revelation 12, I'm sorry, Revelation 2 chapter, and verse 7. Just a few of the things that God has promised us to be a part of the first, or the better resurrection. He says to us, those who overcome, those who overcome this society and Satan, the devil, and so on and so forth, I will grant you to eat of the tree of life, which is the midst of the paradise of God. Verse 10. I'll give you a crown of life. Verse 17, to eat of the hidden man, and I'll give you a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no one knows, saying, He that receives it. Verse 26, I'll give you power over the nations to rule them with a rod of iron, and I'll give him the morning star. So there you are, promises to rule over these Gentile heathen nations around this earth, to rule them and to bring them to the knowledge of truth during the millennium and also during the second resurrection. That's a great thing to have. Great power to have to rule people that way. And when they want to back talk you or sash you or anything, you put it down immediately. Immediately. You won't put it nothing. You won't put up with their mouths or anything. If they continue to, to say they won't have no part of it, just throw them in the lake and get rid of it. Sounds harsh, but you cannot have these type of people in the in the utopian paradise on this earth, who refuse to obey God because you can see what will take place. It was just one, there was that old saying, one rotten animal rots a whole bunch. So you leave one person that way in a family or in a community, he will infest other people. So he or she. So you can't allow that. In the kingdom of God, that won't be allowed. You as you as a teacher, as you as a king or a priest, you'll do something about it, you do something about it immediately until they come to their senses. And 
That's why he used the rod of iron for such a certain while. Now, in chapter 3, in verse 5, he says that person overcomes, talking about the first resurrection, he shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will confess his name before my Father and before the angels. Verse 12, here's an important one. Chapter 3, verse 12, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and I will write on him the name of my of the God, name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is usual, and I'll write upon him my new name. Verse 21. And I'll grant to sit with me in my throne, even though, even as I also overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne. So those are some of the things which will make the first resurrection, the better resurrection, which God promises to be a pillar in the temple of God is a fantastic thing. I have a drawing that is pretty close to what the temple of God looks like. And I didn't know that in the temple of God there is a dining hall for the priest. And there's just not one building, but there's just many buildings in this temple. Many offices, many powers of authority. So your office will reflect your, your authority, your power. If, you, if you're a ruler over 10 cities, your office will reflect that. With great power and great authority. And all these things that God wants to give us. So this is the plan of salvation that God is working out through these three resurrections, which this world knows nothing about. But if you're now, who are out there who are listening to this for the first time, you now know that there's more than one resurrection. There's three resurrections. It shows us how God is going to bring salvation to this earth. If you want to be a part of this, if you've never heard these things before, if you want to be a part of this, just contact our office in Sevier, and we can, we can help you in every way. To a, to a greater understanding because we, as like God says, want all people to come to repentance. To know the saving knowledge of truth. To be a part of the very first resurrection, which is the better resurrection. You were born to be born again.